Hello YouTube friends. I've just spent a few minutes putting the flowers that are dotted all around the house behind me here so that you can see them because it, I'd like to thank everybody who left happy birthday wishes for me for last week either here in the comments underneath this video or over on the Facebook um, Last Only House page, which you'll find by going to Facebook and typing in last, the Last Homely House and the admins there will look after you. And everybody who's left me lovely messages of um, congratulations for my birthday and my lovely, lovely family, because of course I can't see them. Uh, I've got my little bubble, uh, but I can't see people outside of that. And so this has been the fantastic response that people have, um, I'm, feel overwhelmed with love from all of you and from my wonderful family as well. But this is like a little introduction before the main feature. <laughs> That's going to be coming in a minute uh, because I wanted to say hello to, I've seen there's been another growth in subscribers. Uh, people who um, have found me from wherever or just in the YouTube sidebar or whatever, but there's been another little um, lift in the subscriber numbers which always gives me a bit of a thrill and so the last time that happened I made a video and I'm going to put an eye card up here which is like um it's just explaining a little bit about the last homely house and saying hello to all the cats and and everybody <laughs> um and so <clears throat> excuse me I just got some wa water here um so I'd just like to say you're very, very welcome. Uh, I'm Kate. I live here at the Last Homely House. That video might explain a little bit more about what I do here and what you might expect if you subscribe to this channel, which would be fantastic if you wanted to subscribe and click the notifications bell. Because here on YouTube, what I try to do is post on a Sunday at around about seven o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. Now that's my aim. And I mostly manage it, but not always, uh, because real life gets in the way as well. And there's always stuff to respond to in the real world, isn't there? For you, for me, for all of us. Uh, and so that's my aim is to try to post uh, on a Sunday, because that's one of the questions I get asked a lot. You know, when do you post? Sunday evening, seven o'clock, Greenwich Mean Time, usually. But then another thing I wanted to talk about I'll tell you about at the end of this video. So what I'm going to do now is introduce the main part of what I'm talking about. It's going to be part one because uh, it's going to take a long time. It might even be a three part of this. So what I'd say is welcome to The Last Homely House. Welcome to today's video, which is going to be all about the... Um, Preparation for making a mat, uh, rug hooking, proggy matting, hooky matting, all of that. I'm going to explain all of that now. But the beginning bit of this video is getting everything ready uh, so that I can go on and make the project I want to make. But stick around till the end because I've got a few other things I want to talk to you about. And so, um, uh, yes, I'll see you at the end of this video. Enjoy. upstairs to see if I could find the materials I need and fished out a few bits and pieces. I'm going to be using this stuff which is uh, hessian. I think maybe so in some of the parts of the world it's known as burlap. It's the stuff that sacks are made from or were made from. In fact that's its tradition. These um, particular rugs and pieces were made using the flower sacks or the sacks that grain came in. Uh, but now, of course, you buy this by the meter. And uh, I used to have loads of it, but I've got because uh, I used to do this quite a lot. But I've got these little offcuts here and one of them. That's not the right size. It's too narrow. Uh, one of them will be the right size. This one. There we are. That one will be the right size for what I need. So that's perfect. These other bits will make other things some other time, especially if I get back into this. Then the other thing that I need is a wool blanket. Now, um, once of a day you, on your bed, it would be a sheet, a couple of wool blankets, an eider down and maybe a quilt, and you would make the bed. 
with all of those things and you would get properly tucked in and you had this lovely weight of all these blankets and and, and things on top of you. Now you just flick your duvet in the corner in the morning and it settles back down onto your bed like a cloud and it's lovely and toasty and warm but it's you know that's made that's the bed made <laughs> but this this these wool blankets which for quite a long time would turn up in charity shops uh, for a pound each for a dog blankets so um you know people would buy them for their dogs to sleep on and i remember when i first uh, started to do this um oh many 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 years ago now uh, i would go to charity shops to look for wool blankets <laughs> and i would go it says the town where i live there's 10 charity shops or more and i would go in and i would say have you got any dog blankets please and they'd uh, they'd say yeah 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 they'd bring out a pile of dog blankets and I'd I'd go through them and say, no, no, not that one. Uh, no, that one's good. But no, that one's a bit too loose weave. And they'd say, what kind of fussy dog have you got? <laughs> but then I think they realised that uh, rug makers were buying them up for proggy matting. And then they went up to five pounds each or more. <laughs> but they weren't blankets you would ever use on your bed again because they were, you know, we don't use them like that. So I've got this big piece of pink here. And what a surprise. I've got this big piece of green here. Now this one is, is this a full blanket? It might be. And it's got this lovely um, silky satiny bit across the top here, which when you were tucked up in bed, I'm remembering now, you would, you, that would be the lovely bit you would, uh, that wasn't rough, like the rest of the blanket was pretty rough. And they always have these really cool labels in the corner here so I'll keep the label I might put the label back on the thing I'm making but I don't mind cutting this up it's what it's for and so I have pink and green but it's pretty insipid uh, I mean it's all right I'll leave some of it these colors but first of all I'm going to cut some of these into bits uh, and dye them now yeah let's do that then instead of me talking about it I'll show you and I'll show you what, what it is I mean about uh, yeah I'll show you come on let's do that next So I've just been out to the shed to get the the box that's got all the dye stuffs in. Um, so this, this first few here are all to do with dyeing with indigo, which I'm not going to be doing for this project uh, because, oh look, green. Uh, green. Oh, good. S sort of a tealy green. Um, that one's an orangey colour. Not sure we're going to need that. Blue, purple. What else is in here? Another green. These are all my Dylon dyes. And then I've got these acid dyes, uh, which are very strong and powerful. Mahogany, I'm not going to need. Just grey, no. Mahogany again. I haven't got many of these. Malachite. What colour is malachite? And then disco pink. Whoa. Okay. I'm guessing we've got a green and pink theme going on here. What a surprise. I don't need much fabric for this. Actually, that's not true. You always need a little bit more than you think when you're doing this particular form of rug making. Because it's, uh, yeah, we'll, when we get onto that bit, I'll show you. What I'm doing here is totally winging it. Because these dyes are not uh, fabric dyes but they're not um i don't know how you you don't use them like this you would put them in the washing machine i guess so this one is a dark green and i'm putting it into this jar here with a lot of uh hot water in oh that's interesting because i've got hot water in there and vinegar so that was a nice reaction wasn't it let's put a bit more in these are Aren't them my daily teaspoons? I don't use these for eating. They're just in my dye in, in ingredients over here. So that's a nice dark green. And then uh, what I've got here is um, I've got some other dyes here. Tropical green. Tropical green. Same one. Oh, shall I put all of that in then? Intense colour. Let's go for intense colour, shall we? And we'll have some tropical green in here see what happens with this 
I've had these for such a long time, I don't mind if they all get used up. Let's see if this bubbles up as well. Oh, that's a nice green, isn't it? Oh, it's like alchemy going on here. That's a great, great green. Let's put all of that in there. Now, I'm not offering this as a tutorial because I'm totally winging this. But I've done this a number of times before and I like the results. So disco pink now. So this jar here has got um, hot water and um, vinegar because these are acid dyes and this one is my disco pink and I've got a feeling we should put all of that in there yeah why don't we use it all up these dyes are, have been in the shed for the longest time uh, and so I'm hope that, sure they will work why wouldn't they green and pink so I've got two greens this lovely green here and glass is great to do it in. Oh, that's already got a spoon. That's why that's clanking. OK, so I'm going to use this very dark green, first of all, and put that over in my pan that I've got over on the wood burning stove to keep it nice and warm. Now, the thing about when I when I've done this in the past, I do it outside because it's messy and the dye drips everywhere. But also you can hang the pieces outside to dry and there's, it's snowing out there today or has snowed. So it's cold and wet outside today. So I can't do that. So I've got two options. I either put them in the bathroom and have dye dripping all over the bathroom, which I'm not actually that happy about. Or, which I think is what I'm going to do, I just put them all, all the green ones and then all the pink ones on a quick rinse in the washing machine a spin in the washing machine, then I'll hang them up above the clothes dryer. So that's I think that's how I'm going to do that. So I'll set you up so that you can see how the first green one goes in. I've no idea if this will work, but then why wouldn't it? I don't know. We'll try. I'll put a bit more green in that one, I think. I want this first one to be very, very dark. There you are, that's very, very dark. Okay. Okay, I'll set you up over there. So the first very dark one's gone in with the first bit of wet fabric and I'm going to just let and it this fabric was green already but I'm just going to let that sit in there now for half an hour or so and I'm using a, not a food spoon this is a, di a spoon I use for dyeing and here we've got the fire going nicely keeping the in the pot nice and warm. So at the end of this process, I should have a stack of greens, two different greens and pinks for my project. Let's see if that works. So while the fabric's dying, I'm going to do the uh, prep for the fabric, the hessian on the frame. So this is a big, big frame. It's bigger than I need it to be, but that's OK. Um, I have a smaller one, but it's too small. So I'm going to use this one, which is massive, because this is the piece of hessian I'm going to use. And I'm going to sew it. There's some webbing here on this frame and I'm going to stitch the hessian onto the webbing using a very, very, very strong thread, double probably, uh, and uh, stitch that all the way onto here. So I'll find the middle of this, and there's the middle of it there, marked on. 
So we'll take it to there and to there. Yeah, that's about perfect. So this has to, uh, this is going to go under a great deal of tension when I'm working it. And so I need to stitch it on really carefully. Now this is a selvedge, so I'm, I may not need to turn it over, but you know, I think I will, just to give me two bits to sew into. And I'm going to stitch this onto here with an over and over stitch. Uh, right now, let's get one of my tapestry needles. That's a good one. And then this is very, very strong thread indeed. Looks a bit knotted up to me. Let's see what's going on there. Let's cut that bit off and see if we can unknot that. Yeah, that's okay. That's good. Yeah, so I keep this very, very, very strong thread for just this job. No, I can't even tell you what it is because there's no label on it. Okay, just untangle this here. Will we get a knot? Could be some time. Chat amongst yourselves. I'm going to enjoy this project. I've been wanting to make this for the longest time and I keep looking at it and looking at it and thinking, yeah, not now, not now. But then when people started asking me about the work that's on the wall, I thought, well, yeah, I do really enjoy doing it. So let's get going with it again. Knot alert. It's OK, just be patient. You'll get the knot out. Not tight, it's just got a bit looped up. So while I'm doing this knotting, I'll tell you a little bit about how I learned how to do this. Now, as I say, it's a, a very traditional northeastern thing. I think there's a tradition of this kind of rug hooking all over the world, but this particular form that I'm going to be looking at. It originated in Northumberland and Durham and it was the miners wives who made these rugs and they would use the old worn out work clothes or suits. Suits were, were often used. Right I'm just going to tie a massive knot in the end of here. But I'm not going to rely on that knot. I'm also going to loop it through. OK. We don't need that tail on now. I'll just get myself going. So the history of this then is that the miners' wives would make um, a rug on these beautiful big frames. And using their husband's old suits or whatever old fabric there was, sturdy fabric like blankets like I'm using here and then the f and there were some beautiful designs as well so just to, I'm going to start in the middle and go both ways just so as you know what I'm doing here I'm not relying on this knot this is a bit of a tangle but I'll get there Going to be quite a lot of editing in this uh, little thing I think. Okay so we'll just pull that one, arms aren't long enough, there we go. So the way history has it is the women would make these um, mats and the first mat, the, the new mat, would go into the parlour in front of the fire and that would be like the, the best mat and that the mat that it replaced would go uh, into the kitchen and the one that was in the kitchen would go out into the back porch for the dog to sleep on and the one that was in the back porch from the previous year would go out into the stable or into the pigsty for the pigs to lie on and then the very last use it would go onto the compost heap and get composted something like that it would go along those uh, along that sort of history and so that meant that she made one every year 
and it got replaced every year. Lovely traditional patterns often. I mean, we make these now to be decorative, but I like them also to be useful. And so a few years ago, I made one for the sitting room uh, on this frame, uh, in fact. And it's a, I dyed a lot of fabric for that one. Uh, and it's pink and green. <laughs> It's a sort of orangey pink and green and it matches the curtains that I've got in there. So I'll show you those now because I really like that rug. It's just, it's not going in any pigsty anytime soon. Now there are two different styles um, of rug hooking like this in this way. And one of them uses a continuous strip of fabric and makes something like this. And I've made pictures like this. I don't make mats in this way, but um, people definitely do. And it's a continuous strip that gets looped up with a hook. And then, and that's called hooky. And then there's a sort that I'm going to do here, which is called proggy, which is what the sitting room rug is, um, is proggy. And for that one, you cut lots and lots of strips, which I'm going to do with this fabric that I'm uh, dyeing now. Lots of strips. Um, and I'll show you when I cut them how, what size I'm going to cut them. I'm just going to pull this extra tight. This is going to be under a lot of tension. Uh, and then you poke them into the hessian so that it's, it's more like a tufted rug. And depending on how long those tufts are, gives you a nice shaggy rug. So I'm going to make uh, this piece with uh, proggy, with strips, not strips, with little, little pieces, which we'll cut up when all this is dry. So it's quite a long process because uh, first of all, I had to find everything. In this house, that takes a long time. Secondly, I found the, fab the, the old wool blanket and I'm dyeing that. Now I'm stitching this piece of hessian onto my frame, which, you know, if you do it properly, it takes a while. And then once all the pieces are dry, we'll cut them into strips. And I'll probably use my rotary cutter um, to do that. Um, we'll see. So yeah, I'm just gonna carry on and do this now. Still haven't told you what I'm making, have I? It's going to be very useful and functional, which is what I like things to be. Pretty, but functional. And this is something that I've needed for ages. This needle is just a bit too blunt to go through the webbing. So when I first learned how to do this, I have two very good friends who are incredibly talented. One of them, uh, well, both of them have taught, uh, Rachel and Ali. And it was Ali years and years ago. And I can tell you how many years, because my daughter is now in her mid thirties. And when I first did, went to a class to do this, I had one of those clip on high chair things. And Martha, my daughter was clipped onto the frame and was playing with the scraps of, uh, uh, of, of wool blanket and the tools. So that's how long ago that was over 30 years ago when I made my first um, foray into rug hooking. And then over the years, I've just, um, you know, any time I've had taken the fancy, I've, I've done it again. And uh, both of those people make the most beautiful things. And I just, I, I like I do everything, I'm just having a go. I'm not offering this as a tutorial. Not at all. It's just like something like the spinning that I do and all the other stuff that I really like to do. I just like having a go. And actually, it's really quite simple tools you need for this. You don't need much at all. In fact, um, you can. I wonder if you remember those old wooden dolly pegs, the wooden pegs like with the two legs. I haven't got any. But if you snap one of those legs off and sharpen the remaining leg up a little bit, you can use that as a hooky tool. 
as a proddy tool, I beg your pardon, hooky, proddy, two quite distinct things, but all in the same kind of general area. Okay, I'm going to sew this on and I'll get back to you when it's sewn on and I'll show you what I'm going to do with it next. Uh, but while I'm doing that, I'm going to replace the piece of fabric that's in the pot on the stove with another piece so that we keep getting gradations of green going on and see how many uh, lovely different greens we get. It's good fun, isn't it? So everything's sewn on here now and the next thing I've got, to, I've got to do is a little bit like wrestling when when you're on your own with a frame this big I've got to stretch this out now so let me quickly show you if I can I need those in a minute but the hessian is now stitched to the frame now if I was making something wider I would now roll this onto the to the bar so that only the bit I wanted was sticking out. But this is actually quite a narrow thing that I'm making. So I think, I think I can have the whole thing stretched out. Now, let's see, how can I do this? This is going to be really hard to film on my own, <laughs> but I'm up for a challenge. OK, so I've got them balanced on these chair backs here. So if I move that one right along, you can see now, can't you? that there are holes in either end of the frame. It's a very big frame. I think I've said that already. I don't need it to be this big, but it's the one I've got and the next one I've got is too small. These are the stretcher bars then, and they go through the, the slots in the frame like that. Now, obviously the wood expands and contracts a bit and these have been stored outside, but it's going through okay. Okay, so that, that one's going through there beautifully. So I'm just going to move that there. This is a darn sight easier to do if you're just doing it on your own without the camera, but I'm gonna give it a try. So I'll just balance that one there and then I'm going to push this all the way along here. So that the other end is here. These chairs are great. I might use them. Actually, they're a little bit too high, aren't they? For when I'm working it. Now, let's just get that a little bit further away. Otherwise, we're going to have a tipping situation. There we go. And so now, at this end, we've got the holes here. And the stretcher bar is going to go through here with a bit of luck. Everything's going well so far, so let's hope it carries on going well. No, of course it won't. This one has swollen a bit. It's okay though. If I, if I, no, I tell you what I'll do because that side's a little wet. They've been stored outside. I should have brought them in last night, but this end is dry because I've had them by the fire. So we'll try the dry end and the other one will dry out. That's going to go through much easier, I think. Yeah, much better. So that's going to go through there like so. And as you can see, they've got holes in. We'll see in a minute. It's 
quite tricky on your own with such a big frame. I think I've already said that. I'll show you the next thing then that I'm going to use. Let's put that there for now. They're, they're just wedged in, they're not fixed in. Because when I was sorting through the these drawers over here, I found, which has got what's got me started, I found all the things that I need. So the thing that I need at this point here now is nails like this one. So I'm going to use these nails because they're perfect for the job. But because they're a little bit pokey, I've got a cork that I put on the end of them. So I'll take them all off the cork just now. And then... <laughs> I'm going to do this guys and then show you when it's done because it's going to be next to impossible to film and do. You understand. It's very hard when you're on your own. Right, I'll get back to you when I've stretched it all up. So the top of the frame with the holes here, I've opened this out as far as I can to keep this really, really tight because this is what I want. I want my working area to be lovely and tight. And I've put the nails in to these spaced holes. And you can see, can't you, that I've counted one, two, three, put it in the fourth, one, two, three, put it in the fourth. And I'll probably break something if I try and turn this over, but I've done the same on the other side as well. Take my word for it. <laughs> so this is now my, I'll just sit back down again. This is now my working frame and the size of it is perfect. I can see the whole piece now as I'm working it rather than if it was wider, as I say, I would wrap it round one of these or both of these stretchers so that I could just unravel the piece of work I was doing and get it into the middle. But I, I'm going to be able to see the whole piece here at one go, which makes me very happy. <laughs> that was that was quite a struggle, though, because uh, it's... Um, it really does help if you spend a bit of time getting that nice and tight. It's just easier to work rather than it being loose. Although having said that, I know that there are people who work this kind of thing on their knee without a frame at all. And I was, I never learned that way. I learned this way with a frame. And so I, I, I always prefer to have the work under tension, but I've seen that there are people who do this work without uh, with just the hessian and no tension. So the next thing I'm going to do now, I've dyed some of the wool blanket. It hasn't come out as various as I thought it might. So it, this is a functional thing. It wants to be pretty as well, but it is first, first thing functional, second thing attractive. So I'm going to put this to one side now and I'm going to get all the fabric uh, hanging over the dryer here uh, and then I've probably tomorrow before it's dry enough for me to cut and then but then I'm also I'm going to mark on here with a sharpie which you won't see at the end of the work the actual size of the piece that I want because uh, this is a bit too long and a bit too wide which is perfect so that was a struggle but it's done now and then the next thing is deciding where I'm going to work this because it's not really a, on, an on your knee portable kind of thing. But what it is, I've found, is it's lovely to have it in the sitting room, uh, stretched over uh, a couple of, you know, arms of the sofa, so that uh, you can be really comfortable when you're working on it. So I might take it through into the sitting room and do it in there. But for now, I'm pleased that that part's done. All of these are uh, folded over and hemmed and sewn on really firmly with this um, gorgeous double thread. I found all the tools and bits and pieces that I need uh, and um, I'm just going to wait for the fabric to dry now uh, and then we'll get on to the next thing. Oh, very excited to be getting on with this finally. So what do you make of that then? I'll get back to part two of that one I promise. Uh, all the fabric is dyed now and it's all hanging up all over the place drying. Uh, it, it's uh, coming out colours, different colours than I expected, but I like them very, very much indeed. And so we'll get back to part two of that where I actually make, I haven't even told you what I'm making, have I? 
<laughs> I will next time. What a tease. But what I wanted to talk to you about now is a couple of things that go on here at the Last Homely House that some of you might be aware of, but some of you might not. And so I thought it would be a good idea to tell you. Uh, I have a shop. I always link to the shop in the description box below. And the, the way that works is there's always a few things that are always for sale there. There's the virtual downloads, which are always there, of course. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, there are... Um, a few books and cards, little books that I've written about this place. Um, they usually come in a pack of seven, but I've run out of some of them now and I'm, I'm working with the printers to get those printed. So the packs of seven will be back soon, but at the moment some of them are available one at a time. And then the packs of cards also. There'll be some more cards coming in February or March. Uh, it's just yeah, I'm working uh, together with the printers and everyone's on uh, restricted hours and lockdown because of uh, this pandemic. And they're, they're working with very limited staff. They're fantastic. I love my printers. Uh, so the shop then, there's always stuff going on there. I mean, I think there might be like three or four calendars left if you're lucky. <laughs> And also in the shop, there are some uh, zines and stories, which were the Patreon rewards for last year uh, in bundles or singly one at a time. I try to update the shop once a month with a new product. And this uh, month, well, it's kind of like February's product, really, because it's nearly February, uh, is um, uh, an ephemera pack that my daughter-in-law Anna and I have put together for you. Uh, which is going to be useful for anybody who wants to do collage or um, any sort of book making or journaling, any of those kinds of things. Lots and lots of different vintage pages uh, all there in a pack for you. And um, we had some fun putting it together. I have to say, I've got a lot of that kind of thing and it was really lovely to get all those books out and uh, and put together a really interesting pack for you. So they're in the shop just now. And then the other thing, if you like the videos here at The Last Homely House and the comments and the subscriber rate seems to indicate that some of you really do, then I wonder if you know that over on Patreon, there's two years worth of, of videos over there for people who want to go along and have a look at that. Uh, I went this morning to have a look to see what the welcome page looks like and I made a little welcome video which will explain to you all about what's going on over on Patreon. So at the moment I've relaunched all the Patreon tiers for, the, for 2021 and so we've had our first month of those and I, th I think they've gone pretty well. Uh, and so um, I th and the feedback I'm getting is that people are enjoying them. So. Every Friday, there's a themed video on a different theme, uh, which will recur every month. And then every Tuesday for a different tier, there's a, a, a make along where for a few weeks we make something together. And the first make along is just coming to an end. And the second one's going to be launched halfway through February, which I'm excited about. Uh, that's going to be a sewing project. And so I, I think that perhaps People don't quite know that there's all this extra content over on Patreon. And the reason why I'm telling you about this now is that YouTube here on The Last Homely House is an ad free channel. <coughs> uh, I decided right from the start that for as long as I could possibly hold out for, there would be no ads on this channel. Because I think ads are, um, well, I don't like them. You make your own mind up about that. So there's no income at all comes from the YouTube channel, none. And so my income for doing what I do here, which is full time, uh, seven days a week, it um, comes from the shop and it comes from Patreon. And so that's what supports this channel. So you know how sometimes you see a, uh, a YouTube video and it says, this video is sponsored by, well, this video is sponsored by my patrons. Simple as that. I wouldn't be able to manage without them. I really wouldn't be able to do this channel without the fantastic support from my patrons. Now, tonight, uh, on the last Sunday of the month, it should have been last week, but, you know, plate spinning. Um, I'm doing my, my monthly live stream over on Patreon, uh, but I'm not going to invite you to join for that one because I'll tell you something. When you join Patreon, patron take charge the first, the day that you join and the first of the month. So that's tomorrow. 
So you don't want to be paying this number of dollars, pounds, euro, whatever, and then not to pay it again tomorrow. So I'll say wait till tomorrow if you wanted to join. Wait till the first of the month. Always wait till after the first of the month because you'll get charged twice. And I think that's a bit excessive. Uh, and so... Um, but every the live streams are always there. You can watch the you know the last several months and months worth of live streams on catch up, um, and then you'll be able to join in next next month's live stream. I'm rambling now, and so I'm going to wrap this video up by saying thank you very much for joining me. That was a little bit about what else goes on here at the last homely house. Subscribe to the YouTube channel because that's marvelous. That helps me enormously, uh, and then. Click the notifications bell, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I don't mind either one. Um, leave a comment and go and check out my other places. Also on the Last Homely House uh, website, which is where the shop is, the links are down below. I, I have a blog on there and I update the blog about once a week. And it's just a like checking in. A uh, little written thing because I, I actually like writing very much so I like to do a little written blog from time to time with a picture or two. Anyway that's it. Uh, that was longer than I thought it would be and so I'll catch up with you next time. Thank you so much for watching as ever and I will see you next week with part two of this which I'm finding a really really interesting challenge. Take care everybody. Bye now. <laughs>